Um, this morning, Greg and Michelle are in Dothan, Alabama. You gotta say Dothan, Alabama with a little accent when you say it, don't you? They're in Dothan, Alabama, ministering there, and I'm sure having a great time, and so I have the pleasure of sharing with you guys uh, this morning. It's, it's funny because um, one of the passages I'm really uh, hovering around today is, is the passage that I shared up there, which is interesting. But I, want to, um, I like sharing stories, so I want to share a story with you, uh, kind of leading into what we're going to be talking about. When I was about nine years old, um, or maybe about eight years old, <clears throat> we were living uh, in Arizona, and um, we kind of lived in this, this ranch community, and uh, there's, it was gravel roads, and uh, we rode in on horse and buggy. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was just gravel roads. There wasn't a lot of uh, development going on, and, and so you could you could see all the way to the mountains. Now it's totally different. But uh, I, I remember a situation where growing up we had uh, this motorcycle and um, my dad would take us on rides on the motorcycle and we loved it. It was a lot of fun and, and just because of where we lived, you could take it just about anywhere. Well, down the road, I don't know, maybe I'm going to guess about a mile, there was a, a lot that hadn't been built on. And so a lot of people would drive their motorcycles out there and it had little, not jumps, but things, maybe there were jumps. I never jumped. My dad never jumped off those, but he just rode around. It was a fun place to ride around. And when I was about eight years old, you know, through the course of riding with my dad, he used to always say, you know, one of these times you're going to do this on your own. And so I was always a little scared and a little worried about what that was going to be like. And uh, so this one time we were riding around and my dad says, hey, today's the day. You want to give it a try? And I, I was thinking, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And it's a little intimidating. And so he moved me from the back of the seat to the front of the seat. And then I began to steer and and so we were going around this track, and he says, will you let me know when you're ready? And I said, okay, I'll let you know. So as we were going around this track, um, you know, I was doing my best to steer, and he was right behind me, and I, I noticed there's a man standing up ahead as I'm coming around the track, and I look, and it's my dad, and somewhere along the ride, he just slipped off the back of the bike. <laughs> All I want to say is I'm really glad I didn't crash when that happened. <laughs> But as I came around, I was like, you know, that moment of, that guy looks just like my dad who's sitting on the back making sure I'm safe and we're not going to wreck. And um, so he just cheered me on and I kept driving and driving and he's like, so do you, you want to stop? I was like, no, you know, I'm not kidding. My dad had to walk home because I wouldn't stop riding the bike. I just, I, I, I thought, man, he's conquered this great thing. And, and every time I came around my dad, he encouraged me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of this thing that this is your bike. And so uh, the funny thing, as I said, is that, you know, I wanted to ride it so bad. My dad said, well, I'm just going to go home. You enjoy it. And when you're ready, come back. Just be home before dark. I, I must have gone around that track like 300 times. <laughs> just riding and learning a little faster, a little s slower, and then finally rode it home. <clears throat> and I thought that was the coolest thing ever to be able to do that. And it's one of those things in my mind that I knew that the bike was going to be mine, and I knew that, um, that the Lord was, or that my father was going to give it to me. He didn't know when and how, but the moment came for the opportunity, and, and I took hold of it. And uh, um, so much so that, man, that became everything I wanted to do. I, I used to ride the bike miles and miles out and go watch the wild horses, and uh, I just rode it everywhere. That's what I did most of the time when I was young, growing up. Well, the reason I share that story with you is today I want to talk to you about taking hold, and specifically taking hold of, as the Bible says, and we'll read it, the life that is truly life. So I believe that Jesus, through the cross, purchased something for us, and it's life that is truly life. And the, the interesting thing about that, if there is a life that is truly life that the Bible speaks of, then there's also a life that can be embraced that maybe isn't truly life. It's different. We had the opportunity to uh, go back to California and visit some friends and talk with some people. And one of the things that God was highlighting for me as he was, you know, the last couple of months he's been sharing this passage with me and is I was just, for whatever reason, aware of people who were living, but they were just living. You know what I mean? It, it kind of felt, it wasn't that they're unbelievers, it wasn't that they didn't love the Lord, it's that they did love the Lord, but I think the pressures of the world and everything that was going on around them, they were just like living life. They were just waiting to die almost so they could just, you know, get to heaven and, and move on. 
See, I believe that what was purchased for us on the cross was so we can experience right here and now this life that is truly life. A life that is full of hope and and peace and amazing things that would cause other people to look on and go, man, there's something different about that. How can you go through this? How can you hold this? How do you, I mean, you seem positive, you're excited. And that's the life I think Jesus died for that we could, that we could have. So I wanna read through a couple passages and then we'll get into that one I shared with you. This set of Philippians 3. It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory, glory, excuse me, glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by the evil desires. Through his divine power, we get to lay hold of this life that is truly life. And it's different from the life that the world offers. In John 20, it says that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And then lastly, the the one that I shared earlier out of 1 Timothy, says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of a life that is truly life. And that's kind of the the passage. And I realize the context of this is speaking about money and about being generous. But I believe there's a life that is truly life that because of who we are in Christ is presented to us for the taking. And just like my dad presented the opportunity for the motorcycle, I never had to take it. I never had to lay hold of it. It it could have just sat in the garage. It was mine. It could have, but I decided to grab it. And I enjoyed the the fruit of it, if you will. I enjoyed the excitement of it. And I believe as as men, men and women of God in Christ today, there's a life that he wants us to take hold of that is truly life. It was purchased for us. So I want to read one more passage because as I speak about this life, Ephesians 2 really rang for me about this. It says, as, you, you were, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us and in Christ Jesus." For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works that no one could boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, in Christ, and because what was accomplished, we can take hold of this life that is truly life. It's been extended to us, and we get to grab it. So let's do that. Let's lay hold of this. There's, there's probably a long list of things that we could share that this is what it looks like. But there were three particular, and this is where I want to spend the rest of our time today, three particular that I I feel speak to us taking hold of a life that is truly life. So the first one that I want to talk about is to embrace the miraculous. So I think taking hold of the life that is truly life in part is to embrace the miraculous, which means to hug or to receive gladly and eagerly. There's a miraculous element to those of us who are in Christ Jesus, amen? And we get to lay hold of that. There's a supernatural aspect that the world doesn't have, but we get, and we get to lay hold of this. In Mark 16, um, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. And the part that jumps out is it says, these signs will accompany my believers. There's an accompanying that goes on for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And accompany means to follow or to be always at our side, to always be present, to attend one wherever he goes. And so there's this miraculous aspect that follows us as believers where we go. And one of the things I want to look at that I think plays a, a, a good example of this is when Peter ends up, he gets to walk on the water. And the whole concept, I mean, his response is amazing. And I want us to look at this and then we're going to talk about it. But in Matthew 14, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind and he was, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you're the son of God. Now this is, to me, it's kind of an amazing thing that takes place. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because Peter and the disciples are in a boat, and they're being buffeted by the waves, so they're way out in the middle somewhere, and they're not moving, and up comes Jesus walking. And I don't know about you, when, when I read stuff like this, I'm always put into that position, and I think, what, what would I say? And what would I do? So it says that they, they were terrified, which means they were extremely afraid, super scared, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. So th this is a, a serious situation. I, you know, this, this, what I'm about to tell you isn't very serious, but we have this bug that for some reason, you can ask my wife or any of my daughters, when they come home, it decides to come out. And I always know because I hear them cry out in fear. It doesn't matter what part of the house I'm in. And they explain it as this big blackish looking bug that when they get near it, hisses at them. <laughs> so my wife says, you need to go kill this thing. I said, I'm not going to kill it. It's not hissing at me. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but it's happened two or three times. And the first time, man, I leaped from where I was and I started to run outside because it literally sounded like something horrible had just happened. And then there was laughing and I saw people running away and then I figured out what happened. So when somebody cries out for fear, it's a notable expression. It wasn't like the disciples just went, eek, it's a ghost. <laughs> they, were, they were horrified, they were terrified and they're crying out and the response <clears throat> from the ghost says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And Peter's response is amazing to me. It wasn't like, oh, Jesus, don't do that, man. You scared us so bad. That's probably what I would say, right? Or prove to me that you're Jesus. Or, you know, I mean, if you go from horrified and then, but you know something interesting about Peter? There's multiple times through Scripture where he recognizes out of a moment that it's Jesus. Remember after Jesus has is, is, is gone to heaven and he's on the uh, shore He's cooking some fish and he says, throw your nets on the other side and it happens and Peter goes, it's Jesus. Dives into the water and he swims. So, you know, a lot of time Peter gets a bad rap. Oh, he sunk, he did this. Well, everyone else stayed on the boat. Peter was the one that got out and walked. But it's amazing to him what he says is he says, Lord, if that's you, then tell me to come to you on the water. Because what accompanied Jesus was miraculous power. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter walked out on the water. 
So happen to believe that around us and as we're living and as we're walking and we're doing things, according to the scripture, these things accompany believers. Miracles accompany us. And I feel like we just need to be aware and to take hold of them is to look and see. Peter saw an opportunity and he said, then let me come out there. To me, it's a wild thing for him to say, let me get out on the water and come with you. It would be more like, hey, come over here so we can see who you are. But Peter sees a miraculous opportunity. I might have shared this story before, but um, when Michelle was carrying hope, um, we had had Matthew, and then we lost several between Matthew and Amaris, and then we had Amaris, and a lot of complications uh, with Amaris, actually complications with Matthew, that where uh, when Matthew was born, we almost lost Matthew, and then because they were spending so much time on fixing Matthew, we almost lost Michelle. And uh, <laughs> I remember what was going through my mind is Michelle saying, I want 10 kids. Let's have 10 kids. And I thought one is, one is enough <laughs> in that moment. So here's several kids later and Michelle's pregnant with hope and um, she goes in for a routine checkup and the, the doctor kind of comes back in freaking out and says, okay, you need to leave right now and you need to go to the hospital. And so we said, what's going on? And she said, you're fully effaced, you're already dilating and this baby's coming, it's inevitable. You're in full labor. And so Michelle had felt some contractions. They said, you need to get over there because if you don't get this under control, you're gonna have a baby. And she was way too young to be born. So we went to the hospital, they, they began to medicate, you know, they put the, I thought it was kind of funny they, now, they put the bed up so she's kind of laying back. And I thought, wow, that's brilliant. Will that really hold the baby in if you just, <laughs> I see like walking around the hospital and all these moms are, you know, doing handstands and they're up like this to keep the baby in. So they were just doing whatever they could to, to keep the baby in. And uh, so when the doctor came back and they said, look, you have an incompetent cervix and it's, it's completely gone, you're dilated, you know, we've got some medicine to stop the contractions. But basically, she was gonna have to stay in the hospital for the next three months, I think. And a uh, big ordeal, and so immediately, you know, we decided to pray, and so we asked the Lord, Lord, we need you to intervene. I want you to protect the baby and, and, and to protect Michelle. And, and um, so it was probably about two or three weeks had gone by and at that time, uh, Michelle went for a, a routine check and um, they began to uh, measure something. I guess the women would probably know this better than, than the guys, but they began to measure something where her cervix was supposed to be. And so Michelle noticed it and she said, what are you measuring? And he said, I'm measuring your cervix. And so she said, what does the cervix measure? And so he picked up the report and saw what the report said and said, I can't tell you. And Michelle said, what do you mean you can't tell me? And he goes, I'm not allowed to disclose that information. You have to talk to your doctor. She goes, but you are measuring something. And he kind of realized he was in a, in, a, in a hard spot. And so Michelle called me and said, babe, look, I just went in for a checkup and they measured my cervix. And I was like, okay, and? She's like, no, you don't understand. Remember it was gone? Now they're measuring it. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, I, it's, it's back. And uh, the Lord spoke to me, he'd been speaking to me about a passage when Elijah was up on the mountain and he told his servant, go, go look for rain, go look for rain, go look for rain, and nothing was coming. And then finally the guy came back and he said, well, there's a cloud off in the distance the size of a man's fist. And he said, go proclaim rain. And that scripture hit me and I told Michelle, I said, that's the cloud the size of a man's fist. We, we need to proclaim it's gonna rain. So we, we moved to just declaring and praying and saying, you know what, Lord, we, we see what's happening. So I went to the, the emergency room to meet Michelle there. And long story short, met the doctor. And the doctor said, well, it, there is a measurement, but there has to be something wrong because cervix just don't come back like that. And I said, what do you mean? So it's like a miracle? She's like, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm like, you're saying it wasn't there and then now it is. And she's like, well, it, it's, you know, it's, a full measurement would be four and it's not a four. I said, what is it? And she goes, well, it's, it's like a, like a 3.8. <laughs> oh yeah, then that's not a miracle. And I said, so she's, that she's been healed. And she goes, I don't know what you've been doing. I said, we've been praying, she got healed. 
So I called friends and we were celebrating. And so we said, well, can she come home? And they said, no, she can't. And I go, what was she in here for? They said, an incompetent cervix. And I said, but the cervix is back. <laughs> Looks pretty competent to me, you know, as far as I know. And they said, well, well, we'll talk about it in the morning. So in the morning, um, we came and the doctor said, look, I don't know what to say. It wasn't, and it's there, and that never happens in all of my career of doing this. I've never heard, seen, or anything like this. And I said, well, we're declaring she's been healed. She goes, well, you, you can do that. And I said, so I want to take her home. And they actually made me sign a little thing saying I'm taking my wife into my own hands. And so we brought her home, and she went term, and actually three days late. And yeah, praise God. <clears throat> so I, the reason I say that is part of embracing the miraculous is, is noticing when, when something's happening. And it was through a passage that I read that I'm like, I don't know how this applies to anything in my life, what's going on. And then it struck and then the Lord highlighted it. And I said, oh my gosh, that's the cloud the size of a man's fist. We need to proclaim rain. So embracing the miraculous is doing that. It's, it's, it's looking for that opportunity that God's settling. And miraculous doesn't have to be someone raised from the dead or anything. It's any miracle that takes place. Um, this kind of goes with the next one I'm gonna talk about. But you know when Elijah, when someone runs to Elijah and goes, hey, the ax head of my ax flew off and now it's out in the water and I can't find it and it was rented, I'm in trouble. And he breaks a stick off and he throws it in the water and then the ax head floats. I'm like, that's, that's pretty miraculous. Or the guy says, oh my gosh, this is another one that's funny to me. Try this at your next gathering when you have people over. They, they go and collect all these mushrooms, I think, or um, stuff. They put it in a pot and they make a soup. And then people start getting sick. And they're like, oh, there's death in the pot. So Elijah throws flour in. Poof. Okay, it's good to eat now. Imagine you have people at your house and the stew went bad and they're like, I don't feel so well. And so you just grab some flour, threw it in, stirred it up. It's good now. You go first. All right? But the miraculous accompanies us, those who are in Christ. It goes along with us. And the list that was given that I read, that's part of it. But I think there's so much more. There's the miraculous for your life. There's the miraculous in the people that you engage with and that you have an opportunity to meet. Take hold of the life that's truly life. Let's embrace the miraculous. The second thing I want to talk about is not just embracing the miraculous, but engaging the impossible. To engage is to secure or hold fast to or bring into. In Matthew 19, when he's talking about it's easier, well, let me just read it. Verse 23 then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. Now again, I understand this is in the context of of rich and wealth, and, but he makes the comment. He doesn't say, but with God, this too is possible. He says, with God, all things are possible. And with man, it's impossible. With God, it's possible. I believe when something is impossible, it's a platform for God to show his power and his kindness. I believe there's a platform that's laid in that way. And let me give you an example, and I was gonna read this, but for time's sake, I'm just gonna share it. So the story of David and Goliath, Right? Um, David's shepherd, Samuel comes, anoints him. You're gonna be the next king, pours oil over his head. Everyone goes, that was cool. Okay, go back to the sheep. David goes out there, takes care of the sheep. His brothers go on to what they're doing. And the Philistines come to engage war against Israel. And the first thing I wanna say is the Philistines weren't some little tiny army that had no business messing with Israel. They had no business messing with Israel because they were God's people. But this was a fierce army. This wasn't some tiny, hey, we'll see what we can do. They were a mighty army in that time that decimated people. And so they stood across from one another in this valley and Goliath came out as their champion. Goliath, huge, nine feet tall, lots of big weapons and things. He was a giant. 
And he comes out and says, hey, let's make this easier. You send your champion out to fight me. We'll go at it. Whoever wins, the other people serve the other people. And for Goliath to say that, what do you honestly thought was going to happen? He thought, I'm going to defeat whoever they send because they don't have any giants. This is going to be an easy win for us in the Philistines. And these guys, all of these guys are going to serve us. Do you know how long he challenged? 40 days he went out and did this exact same thing over and over and over. And the Israelites were, were seized with fear. Now I happen to believe the person that should have gone up against him was Saul. That was their champion. He was the leader. So David comes in, asks a few questions, what's going on? And people tell him, his brothers get angry with him because they're like, what do you think you're doing coming out here and, and pushing this thing? And then David said, you know what? I'll take care of this. Saul tries to give him armor and he goes, let me do it my way. Goes up against Goliath. Goliath is, can't believe they sent a boy to do a man's job. But that boy hits him in the forehead with a stone, kills him, chops off his head with his own sword and Israelite advance, the Israelites advance, take over the Philistines. To me, that's an impossible thing. If you're sitting there with a whole army of people, trained, ready for battle, and not one of them is willing to go forward, and the guy that comes up to do it is David, a boy. Says that he was handsome and healthy. What do you think that means? <laughs> He wasn't a soldier. He didn't look like a soldier. He didn't look like he'd been standing out there in the wilderness for 40 days with this guy shouting stuff. The situation looks impossible. You're gonna put all your hope in David, this guy that can't even wear the armor, that can't do it the way we did? And what does God do? He uses that for his glory. See, there's several components that I think are really important when we're talking about engaging Oops, sorry. We're talking about engaging the impossible. The first thing is I, we need to be propelled by the prophetic. And this is what I mean. Not too long before David was out there getting ready to fight, it, he had oil poured over him and there was a prophetic word given that he would be the next king. I think that gave him some courage and strength that when he faced David, he might have even thought, I'm not gonna lose this one because I had a prophetic word over my life that I'm to be the next king. And if that's true, this guy's no problem at all. And honestly, I think there's some of us in this room that have prophetic words spoken over our lives. And for whatever reason, may, maybe um, the, the weight of just waiting a long time or, or, or situations or things, the enemy has done whatever he can to blanket it, to push it down and not allow it to rise up to be the thing that, that you press forward for. And I think we need to allow the prophetic to propel us. When Michelle and I were leaving Texas to come here, and on our last service there, there was one guy was being set in and they were kicking me out. No, I'm just kidding. And one of the gentlemen got up who's there and he gave us a prophetic word. And he said, you know what? Today starts the day, today starts the day that the Lord begins to repay the years the locusts have eaten. And that, that was, I mean, there were a lot of words, but that was like, boom, it just hit. And, you know, I don't want to go into all the detail, but there had been a lot of difficulty prior to that and stuff they'd went through and, and all of that stuff. But then we began to see, it's almost like the Lord was going, ah, see, I told you, I told you, I told you. And that became a, a word that we've embraced and we just continually see God's faithfulness through that word that was spoken. Be propelled by the prophetic. The second thing to be prepared, blah, I'm getting tongue-tied, be propelled by is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to remind us, to encourage us. One of the words I, used to, I, I like to use is highlight. I feel like the Holy Spirit highlights things. And so we want to be prepared, propelled, I should have picked a different word, propelled by the Holy Spirit. And I did the two differently because the prophetic words, we get given in all kinds of different circumstances. You take that prophetic word and what's the Holy Spirit saying? As it's confirmed and as those things, that man, let that propel you. Be in situations where the Holy Spirit guides you to do something, to step out in faith in an area. And even when it looks impossible. Guys, we, we face a lot of impossible circumstances. 
And the funny thing is, in the world, they avoid the impossible. And as believers, we need to engage it. Because things that are impossible to man are impossible for what? For God. All things are possible with God. So be prepared by the Holy Spirit and also be propelled by the size of our God. Don't forget how big and capable and faithful and trustworthy and kind our Lord is. That's what makes the impossible possible because of who he is and who we are in him. When Michelle was in the hospital with hope and those issues, it wasn't, it was me connecting with what the Holy Spirit was speaking. What, what looked to be impossible became possible because of God. And the same thing with David. The impossible shouldn't be something that pushes us into fear or a frozen state. The impossible, I believe, is a drawing pad that the Lord loves to write history on with your name involved. He looks for those opportunities. You don't believe me? What about Gideon? Let's take your big, huge army and let's shrink it down to this tiny bit of guys who drink differently. Isn't that Gideon? Okay, thank you. I'm like, wait a minute. Story of Gideon, he's got this huge army. The Lord says, hey, first tell the people if, if you have fear, go home. Hey, anybody have fear, go home. And there goes a whole bunch of people. I'm thinking, I don't know if that was a good plan. So he goes, let's go down, drink some water. And everyone who laps like a dog or everyone who holds it up to their mouth, their mouth, send these guys home. So he's left with this small group of people. And the Lord says, now this is what I need. It's a platform of the impossible so that he can show his glory through it. And he wants to do that in, in our, just like, honestly, if someone, I know I just shared this, but if someone came up to me and said, hey, my ax head just fell in that river over there and I need to get it. It's a, I mean, I'd be like, okay, everyone stand here, form a line and let's just go like this in the water. Someone will find it. That makes sense. But in my mind, I'm going, there's no way we're gonna find this ax head. It sounds impossible. That's what is impossible is possible for God. So last one I want to talk about today is enroll in the generous. Enroll in the generous. See, I think, I'll just be honest with you, a generous life, it's just fun, guys. Being one who's generous, it's just fun. L listen to Luke 12. <clears throat> Someone in the crowd said to him, to Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man who, appoint, man who appointed me to judge or an arbitrator between you. Then they said, excuse me, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. I think the world would argue with us because I think the world pushes that just get a little bit more. Going back to the first passage that I shared with life taking hold of life, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And it's a loaded passage right there. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. See, a generous life keeps us from becoming greedy or putting our, help, our hope in wealth. And like I said, it, it's just fun. The world feels the need to provide itself with more and accumulation is the key. If I just get my hands on a little bit more. But the life that is truly life, we have on record that God will provide us with everything for our enjoyment. Remember this, verse six, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not, reduc not reluctantly or under any compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase your storehouse of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. 
You will be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. See, gener- being generous isn't defined by how somebody else is generous. And what I mean by that is if we start looking at how Tyler was generous, and now that becomes the standard of me being generous, and he's in a different position in life, then I might feel like I can't ever do this. But being generous is for you to latch on to and to be generous, how the Lord directs you, how he wants you to give generously. And each one of us being in different places, it doesn't have to be same, same. I don't use other people to determine what generosity is. I use the Holy Spirit. I use the Lord because he's going to provide. I love that passage that I read because everything speaks to increase and supply in every need and you'll have what you need. All things, all times, have what you need. You will abound in every good work. He'll increase our store of seed. We'll be enriched in every way so you can be generous. And ultimately, a generous lifestyle, it brings about thanksgiving. So when I'm talking about embracing the miraculous or engaging the impossible or enrolling in the generous, you know the coolest thing about this, this, all three of these and others, were purchased for us by the blood of Jesus. So it's just something I get to grab hold of. It's just something I get to engage or embrace. There is a part that I play, but it's been done for me. I just need to lay hold of it. I just need to take hold of it. And again, I said these are only three but we were called to something greater than just living, amen? We're called to living a life that is truly life. Why? Because it's been purchased for us. It's been extended to us, it's been given, and we've all heard the analogy, if I give somebody a gift, you still gotta take it. You can leave it under the the Christmas tree, you can leave it on the table, whatever, and just let it sit there forever. But as soon as you grab it, it's, it's been your gift all along. It's been in your possession all along. But until you grab hold of it, then now it's something that's useful and you can access. And I think that's what, the, that's what I feel like the Lord's saying to us. So let's be those who embrace the miraculous. Why? Because it accompanies us wherever we go. Let's be those who engage the impossible because it becomes a platform for God to write history on. And let's enroll in the generous. If you're in a position like, I, I don't know how to be generous. You know one of the things I've learned in life, and uh, maybe this is just me, but as life moves and I, and I get a raise or I get a better job or something else would happen, it just seemed like my life fit into what that was. Anybody ever experienced that? You're struggling, you're like, gosh, if I could just get into this or if I could get this, if I could get a new job or any of those things and it, because we're, we're so tight and then you get a job and wow, we've got all this more funds and then we just shift into a new way of life and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, if I could just get a better job with, with how many of you know that can happen sometimes? And that's, that's the whole thing of, that the world does, just a little more, it's just get more, it's just this. I'm not saying more is bad because look at all the things that God says. But when we live a generous lifestyle, when we're living in that position of generosity, I'm telling you, it keeps us from greed, it keeps our focus on where it should be, and we're continually looking, looking to him to provide and to give and even to show us how to be generous. Because he wants us to be. But all of these things already purchased for us. It's not something I have to work. It's not that if I don't, here's the truth, if I don't engage these, that the Lord's gonna go, okay, that's it, Tom, I've had it. Does it change that? It's stuff that, it's gifts he's given to us. He loves me whether I grab him or not. He's, he's gonna favor me, he's gonna do all those things, but these are gifts he's given to us so that we can live that life that is truly life. And honestly, I, it causes other people to notice as well. Amen? So I wanna do this, I didn't say, Richard, could you come play? And what I wanted to do, I just wanna spend a few moments, nothing long, and I just, I just want, we're gonna soak before the Lord, and I just want you to consider these three areas, embracing the miraculous, engaging the impossible, or enrolling in the generous. And I just want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what do you wanna to speak to me about these? Because we come before a God who's wonderful, and he loves us, and he's kind, and I, I think, the Lord wants to talk, to talk to us about these. And just ask him if there's one in particular. Ask him what he's speaking to you. You know, one of the things I love about having the opportunity to preach is sometimes when we're done, someone will come up and go, man, that was a great job you did. And especially when you talked about this point. And I'm going, yeah, 
I never mentioned that. <laughs> that wasn't one of my points. <laughs> Thanks for listening, you know. But what happened is the Holy Spirit spoke to them through something I said and gave to them what they needed. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. So whether it's one of these three or it's something else, I just want to spend a few moments just soaking before the Lord. And let's listen to him, and then we've got the week to respond to what he says. Sound good? Jesus, we just come before you this morning. We're so grateful that you are the giver of life. So thankful that the position that we're in is you've given us the opportunity to lay hold of life that is truly life. We don't have to be guided by the things of the world. We don't have to be pressured by the things of the world. But just to rest in you. And we thank you for that. So as we take a moment to soak, Lord, would you just, Holy Spirit, would you just speak to us? Just thank you, Lord. Jesus, we thank you so much just for your kindness, for the relationship that we get to have with you. And Lord, we choose to grab hold of a generous life, choose to trust you in the impossible, choose to recognize that we're accompanied by the miraculous wherever we go. Thank you for this life that is truly life that we can lay hold of. We just bless you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.